Welcome to BBC News. Let's turn to our main headlines here. Iran strikes at Israel with an unprecedented attack involving more than 300 drones and missiles. Almost all of them were intercepted before they landed. The US, Britain and Jordan were among the countries involved in Israel's defence. A member of Israel's war cabinet warns Israel will retaliate. The US has warned it doesn't want the crisis to escalate into a wider war, but says it's up to Israel how to respond. It says it won't take part, though, in any attack on Iran. In Tehran, supporters of the Iranian government celebrate the attack. Iran warns Israel not to retaliate and says it has no intention of prolonging operations. Well, these are the live pictures from Jerusalem. Worth just noting that Benjamin Netanyahu's war cabinet has met as the region remains at a dangerous crossroads. Well, those are our main headlines on that, our main story. Israel warning that it will retaliate. We don't know how after Iran fired that huge barrage of drones and missiles at Israel. Well, let's get more reaction, political reaction. Let's head to Downing Street because uh, our correspondent Azadeh Mashiri is there for us. And Azadeh, it's been a few hours now, but Rishi Sunak has been talking about the UK's involvement. Uh, tell us a little more about what he said. Well, the message uh, out of Downing Street has been consistent throughout the day. He's uh, condemned the attack. He's called it reckless. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he's urged calm and restraint, similar to other uh, allies. That's certainly the message coming out of the U.S. as well. And part of it is this huge concern that there's the risk of escalation in a region that's already going through a volatile war. Now, it's confirmed, uh, Downing Street has confirmed, and, and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has confirmed uh, that it was part of what it called an international coordinated effort in defending Israel. And uh, he recently gave us a few more details out of, uh, out of Downing Street of exactly how the UK participated in that operation. In fact, we can take a listen now. Last night, Iran launched a barrage of missiles and attack drones across the Middle East towards Israel. This was a dangerous and unnecessary escalation, which I've condemned in the strongest terms. Thanks to an international coordinated effort which the United Kingdom participated in, almost all of these missiles were intercepted, saving lives not just in Israel but in neighbouring countries like Jordan as well. The RAF sent additional planes to the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones. I don't want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger to protect civilians. Well, that was Rishi Sunak. Uh, Azadeh, just take me through the other political reaction there's been today. Well, so the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, as well as his shadow cabinet, have echoed the Prime Minister's words there about, uh, about calm and restraint. Uh, but it's important to pick out there what Rishi Sunak said. He, he confirmed that RAF planes did intercept Iranian attack drones, though he didn't confirm how many. And now, while Labour and the Liberal Democrats have backed that action, they under, they've also said that Iran's uh, attack was uh, reckless and unprecedented. Uh, it's still unclear how, what's, how, what steps Downing Street took to get to that decision. And so the Liberal Democrats, for example, are calling uh, for a parliamentary vote. They say that they don't want to do away with the precedent of Parliament approving military action, even if that military action has taken place. Uh, Yvette Cooper, the uh, Shadow Home Secretary, uh, has said that she expects the Prime Minister to make a statement to the House of Commons tomorrow. And so while uh, all parties are echoing that same message of calm, restraint, de-escalation, they still want to know uh, more about how uh, Downing Street came to that decision, uh, the details of that emergency meeting uh, that the Prime Minister said he chaired on Friday. Uh, and of course, they want to make sure that, that precedent is respected. As today, a quick one on that G7 call. Where are we with that? We know that uh, that call with Joe Biden and other world leaders. 
We know that the, to uh, the talks are taking place right now and that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is engaged in those talks right now uh, behind me. Uh, now, we don't have the details. They haven't come out yet. Uh, but in some ways, we've already been telegraphed the overarching goal. We keep hearing the word diplomacy because while Israel is talking about uh, a strong response, exacting a price out of Iran for this unprecedented attack, saying that it could have caused more damage than it did, even though it was largely intercepted, uh, allies, Israel's allies, really don't want to see this escalate into a regional war, uh, especially when you, you see what's already going on in Gaza. And so you can expect that what they're discussing right now is how to make sure that those tensions don't escalate further. Azaleh Mashiri there in Downing Street. Thanks very much. If we get more from that readout of that call, we'll be returning to you. Thanks a lot. Now, earlier on the programme, I spoke to Qatar Arabi, who's uh, director of Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Research at United Against Nuclear Iran. Well, he gave me his analysis on last night's attack. This was a very well choreographed attack uh, by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the Iranian regime's paramilitary organisation. And its purpose serves the regime's propaganda needs to mobilise its internal small but radical constituency and also its proxy networks as well as uh, its pro the pro-palestinian constituencies and islamist extremist constituencies across the world as well as that beyond that propaganda purpose it's also to push the boundaries of the red lines push the boundaries of the red lines see how much it can get away with despite the fact that this was as i said a well choreographed symbolic attack it's still unprecedented in nature, and we should expect an Israeli retaliation. In terms of your analysis, I hear what you're saying about propaganda. I suppose the, the question is how far Iran wanted to go, wants to go, because uh, a lot of analysts pointing to the fact that this was well telegraphed yes. in, in terms of what they were going to do. You even had uh, uh, Iranian representatives saying the response had concluded before the drones even arrived in the region. So does that say to you that they wanted to give the impression of a tough response but not have that wider escalated war? Yes, because the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, neither has the military doctrine nor the capabilities for a direct full-scale conflict with Israel. The IRGC operates asymmetrically. It is effectively a militant organisation. So it doesn't have the capabilities to take on Israel. This was a symbolic attack. It serves the regime's propaganda purposes, but still unprecedented in nature and strategically reckless. The key thing here now is when Israel retaliates, because Israel will retaliate, US support for Israel. Because if the Iranian regime perceives a lack of US support for the Israeli retaliation, we will see a continuation of escalation, particularly in the next 10 months, before uh, a potential new administration in the White House. In terms of how Israel responds, what are the most dangerous options from Tehran's point of view in terms of would force their hand? I think the regime in Iran believes that the US, for example, has zero appetite for direct confrontation. It has zero appetite for imposing direct consequences on the regime, despite the escalation that we've seen since October the 7th. And that includes, by the way, more than 170 proxy attacks on US forces, including the killings of three US soldiers. Now, that cal calculus has to be changed. So these targets have to be inside of Iran. And we are talking about military intelligence assets, IRGC military intelligence bases, senior IRGC commanders who are spearheading these militant operations, as well as potentially the nuclear sites. Again, going back to that 10-month uh, time frame, the rage there is a lot of chatter inside the regime, amongst the Supreme Leader's circle, amongst IRGC commanders, that the next 10 months may be the best time to weaponize their nuclear program because they believe the Biden administration does not seek to impose direct consequences on the regime in Tehran. S simple question next. Why didn't Iran as they have so many times in the past, simply use proxies to carry out some sort of attack. The regime in Iran wanted to, as I said, serve the propaganda purpose because 
everyone was questioning, including its own support base, why is there's a lot of tough talk, but there's zero action to back it up. So they were under pressure to act. They were under pressure to mobilize their core constituency, core limited constituency, I should say, because the majority, overwhelming majority of Iranians have been explicitly calling for regime change and have actually even supported Israeli strikes against IRGC commanders, not least Mohammad Reza Zahedi, who was killed two weeks ago. So this was to respond directly, push the boundaries of the red lines, um, if the regime in Iran genuinely wanted to land a blow to Israel, it would have used its proxies who, are, who have encircled uh, the Israeli state uh, and therefore they could have landed a more effective strike. This was serving propaganda purposes, but also crucially pushing the boundaries of the red lines. Very, very reckless. Is, is there one more element to this which suggests a weakness in the Biden administration? Because in the run-up to this, we have talked about it being telegraphed, but it was reported back channels were used to Washington to suggest that if Joe Biden was to able to bring in a ceasefire, to force Israel to have a ceasefire, that perhaps these attacks would not have happened. And, of course, he wasn't able to do that. Does that underline the weakness there of Washington's influence on Israel? No, I don't, I don't see it that way. I think the weakness that the regime in Iran perceives of Joe Biden is that he has zero appetite to impose direct consequences on the regime in Iran. I don't think this is linked to a ceasefire. The regime in Iran has, since October the 7th, been escalating on all fronts. As I said, more than 170 proxy attacks, who were, who was, who was, which was spearheaded, by the way, by Mohammad Reza Zahedi, who was killed by Israel two weeks ago, including killings of three US soldiers. And the US still hasn't responded to the regime in Iran directly. It's still not shown appetite to do so. They believe they have 10 months. These next 10 months could be the best opportunity to escalate, not only against Israel, on the nuclear portfolio. Also, let's not forget that the IRGC is the single biggest backer of Putin's war in Ukraine. Those Shahed drones that were fired on Israel last night are the same Shahed drones that are being fired on Ukrainian civilians. So in the next 10 months, if we don't see firm US support for an Israeli, Israeli retaliation, expect escalation, escalation not only in the region, also in uh, Ukraine, and as well as that, across the board in terms of U IRGC terrorism in Europe. Kasra Arabi talking to me a short while ago. Now, let's get more from BBC Verify because, uh, as we've been seeing, they've been looking at more of the images and the videos from overnight. So let's cross to our reporter, Merlin Thomas. And Merlin, take us through it. For the first time, Iran has carried out direct strikes against Israel. An Israeli army spokesperson said that overnight hundreds of drones, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles were launched against Israel. Now, Israel says 99% were intercepted and destroyed, with one child reportedly injured by shrapnel. We verified several videos showing intercepts, and this one is filmed from near the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. And in this next video, you can again see missiles or drones heading for targets in Israel and air defences intercepting them. And this is a still from the video I just showed you. We've matched that with this publicly available image, which is on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And Israel has said a handful of the ballistic missiles weren't intercepted and hit the Nevatim air base, which is here, and it caused minimal damage. This is a satellite image of the base from August last year. And we have several videos purporting to be of the base being hit, but most of the footage is taken in the dark and we're still working on verifying these. Israel released this footage showing a fighter jet returning to the airbase to emphasize that it continues to be fully operational. We haven't been able to verify whether this was filmed today. And we don't know which of the Iran's, Iran's ballistic missiles hit the airbase, but Iran State TV has shown this and called this one an Imad missile. Now that type of missile has a range of 2,000 kilometers, and this map shows you just how far that sort of weapon can reach. And we've also seen videos from Iran of missiles in flight, like this one. This video was sent to BBC Persian, and they've checked the file data to establish that it was filmed in Shiraz in southern Iran. And at moments of heightened tension, misinformation has been circulating. Now, Iran State TV repeatedly aired a video of a fire in Chile, claiming that it was footage of missiles successfully hitting targets in Israel. We found the original of the clip, which was posted to TikTok in February, and the Israel Defense Forces posted this video 
compilation on X of Iran's retaliatory attacks. And most of the clips are of the attack, but there's one old clip right at the end of the video here. And from, that is actually from nearly 10 years ago of a Russian grad rocket launcher from this video. Now, this is a moment of heightened tensions in the Middle East as we wait to see how Israel will react. At Verify, we'll continue to monitor the situation closely. Merlin, thanks very much. Uh, more of the images and video being looked at there by BBC Verify. Let me tell you a line that has just come in, uh, not a great deal of detail, but that G7 call that we know was going on with Joe Biden. One line just being reported that the G7 has condemned Iran's attack on Israel and has called for restraint. When I was talking to Azadeh Mashiri in Downing Street a short while ago, uh, she was saying and anticipating exactly that line. But uh, the first line emerging from that call, the G7 condemning Iran's attack on Israel and calling for restraint. Uh, we'll get more from that call in the next little while. But let's return to uh, the defence that we saw uh, that uh, Israel used. We know that other countries like the US, the UK involved because Iran launched more than 300 drones and missiles towards Israel. Some 99% of those incoming wave of strikes was intercepted either outside of Israeli airspace or over the country itself. Well, our defence correspondent, Jonathan Beale, explained how Israel was able to thwart that wave of attacks. But the first thing to say, it was telegraphed, so they knew it was coming. Um, and they had preparations in place, both Israel and the US. So the US has had a carrier strike group uh, in the Red Sea dealing with Houthi missiles being fired from Yemen, which are being provided, the US says, by Iran. So they've had practice. Then clearly Israel has had practice with its Iron Dome, with rockets fired on a regular basis. Uh, and, and multiple, you know, at the same time from Gaza into Israel over a number of years. So I think Iran would have known that those air defence systems were up and running and that they would take out quite a lot of what they were firing. Now, obviously, it's more difficult to take out a ballistic missile than it is to take out a drone. But Israel has layered air defences, so it doesn't just have the Iron Dome, which is for shorter range targets. It also has arrow, arrow two and three to take out ballistic missiles. US ships have been taking out ballistic missiles fired by Houthi rebels, anti-ship missiles. So they would have known that that capacity was there. That said, Iran does have an arsenal of missiles and drones, which it's been providing to other proxies, but its own massive arsenal, which could have overwhelmed the defences of both the US in the region and Israel, but they didn't. So most from what we're being told were shot down. It seems like one or two may have made their way through. So I think there was a calculation by uh, Iran. The question and, and what you can't, you know, it's, it's a gamble to, to work out what Israel might do next. The US has made clear it's not going to respond against Iran directly, but the question is what will Israel do next? Jonathan Beale. Now, Shashank Joshi is defence editor for The Economist. He gave us his assessment of Iran's tactics with this latest attack. There was, I think, about 331 missiles, uh, projectiles fired. Of those, about a third were ballistic missiles. Um, ballistic missiles fly in very different ways. They fly in parabolic arcs, unlike cruise missiles or drones, which fly relatively flat trajectories inside the atmosphere much more slowly. Ballistic missiles are much more likely to penetrate air defences and get through, and they leave much less warning time. But I think it's notable that only a third of these weapons were ballistic missiles. They were probably targeted at Israeli military bases, including the base that Israel used to launch F-35 planes that conducted the original attack on the Iranian consulate in Lebanon. And so there was a kind of symmetry to this. But had Iran really wanted to cause more damage, had Iran really sought to overwhelm Israeli defenses, I think they would have used a much higher proportion of ballistic missiles. And they didn't. And I think that does tell us something of interest, something of note. I think it was in line with expectations of an Iranian attack that was both sufficiently dramatic in scale and novelty, of course, the first direct Iranian strike on Israel uh, to satisfy Iran's need to restore deterrence. 
but also calibrated enough, limited enough, in order to avoid inflicting such serious harm uh, that it may have provoked a larger conflict. Um, notably, I think the most significant thing here is the length of time that Iran waited before responding, allowing Ira Israel and its allies to muster a response, evacuate air bases, prepare their radar facilities, all of these other things. And I think Iran would have known that most of these missiles would probably have been intercepted. Well, I've also been speaking to our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera. This was his take. The two sides have been engaged in a, a shadow war for decades, really, in which uh, I I Iran has been using its proxies, uh, groups like Hezbollah, to uh, fire missiles and carry out a other activities against Israel and even inside Israel. Um, and Israel has been targeting, for instance, Iranian nuclear scientists going back uh, decades, including within Iran. But you've not seen that kind of direct confrontation that we've seen uh, in the last 24 hours and including that uh, targeting of an Iranian consulate in Damascus. So I think it is an escalation. It is significant. But the question is, what next? Well, exactly, because uh, President Biden and others can talk about containment, but there are so many variables at play, aren't there? That's right. And you can sense from the language coming out from the US that they are urging both publicly and I'm sure behind the scenes uh, Israel to carry out a measured uh, response in how it deals with this, because the US do not want to escalate into a wider war. All the signs have been that Iran also doesn't want to escalate into a wider war or to get into a war with the United States, which could obviously be very serious for the, the regime in Tehran. So th there are incentives uh, not to escalate, but the reality of these situations is, is often that uh, events uh, can spiral out of control. And you could imagine a situation in which one side launches a strike which kills more, does more damage than expected. And that does lead to an escalation which can drag more parties in and lead to more significant strikes. So I think that is the concern as everyone waits to see what Israel will do. I mean, the noises coming out of Israel are mixed. I mean, we've heard some of the uh, more hawkish members uh, linked to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his coalition talking about the need to re-establish deterrence, which would mean a, a hardline uh, stance and some kind of strike against Iranian interests. Others like Benny Gantz, who's in the war cabinet, have talked about rather uh, responding in a manner and a, a means of uh, and a time of their choosing, which would suggest a more measured, careful response. So I think there will be uh, lots of thoughts, lots of behind the scenes negotiations to try and uh, work out what that response might be. And I think uh, it's hard to say exactly at the moment. Gordon Carrera, let me tell you, in the last few moments, uh, the UK's uh, Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, has said uh, he condemned in the strongest possible terms Iran's attack on Israel in a call with Iran's foreign minister. So that news just coming into us. Plenty more on that story in a moment or two. But before we break, I just want to squeeze in one more story, an important story, because more details have been emerging today about the victims of the deadly knife attack at a shopping centre in Sydney yesterday. Six people were killed and 12 injured. Our correspondent Katie Watson has sent the latest from Sydney. From the early hours of Sunday morning, Sydney siders came to pay their respects. This is a nation in shock, not used to violent attacks like this. I go to the like mall with my friends and stuff, but it's just sad to think like you can't even really like shop normally now without thinking twice about like who's around you and all this stuff. Yeah. The attacker was named as Joel Couchy, and more details about his background have also emerged. We do understand that there is a history of mental health, uh, but it will be the ongoing work of the investigators to determine what his activities were yesterday and the days before that might indicate a motive. Authorities singled out the bravery of Inspector Amy Scott, who shot the assailant dead. Her intervention, they said, saved many lives. The investigation is still very much underway. Uh, police teams are working there and they could be working through to the early hours of Monday morning. Now, the commissioner said at this stage there are probably more questions than answers and that's something that will probably continue for the next few weeks. More details of the victims also emerged. Ashley Good died trying to protect her nine-month-old who was injured. Overnight, the little girl underwent surgery. Faraz Tahir was working as a security guard at the Westfield when he died. 
After the panic and fear of Saturday, people here are grieving, trying to understand why such a brutal attack happened. Katie Watson, BBC News in Sydney. Well, we're going to take a short break. When we're back, we'll have all the latest from the Middle East. We're live in Jerusalem, live in Washington. We'll also talk to the former head of the British Army. All of that coming up here on BBC News. Don't go away. Hello. The warm spell of weather has come to an end. It's a much fresher day for all of us today. And the outlook is pointing to frequent showers with hail and thunder and very windy weather for tomorrow. And here's the weather map as we see that transition in the next 24 hours from the calm conditions we've recently had to this big low sitting right on top of us, also dragging in the colder air from the northern climes. And that's going to make it feel colder than it recently has been. Onto the forecast then. Temperatures middle of the afternoon will have hovered just around the mid teens across the southeast of the country, barely making double figures across the north where we already have showers sweeping across. The winds are freshening. Now, the showers through the course of the night will be generally confined to more northern and western areas, and then towards the end of the night, perhaps reaching central England. But the southeast is going to stay dry. North or south, temperatures will be typically between, say, six and eight degrees Celsius in most major towns and cities. So tomorrow, a band of heavy showers sweeping across the country, gusty winds, showers could be torrential with hail and thunder, sunshine in between, and those gusts could approach 50 miles an hour or more around coastal areas and not far off that inland as well. So a very turbulent day with dramatic cloudscapes and changeable weather from hour to hour and lowish temperatures between 10 and 12 Celsius. And that low will be barreling across the UK and into the North Sea through the course of Monday evening. Now, Tuesday, it'll still have what we often call a sting in its tail. So stronger winds and some showers along the North Sea coast, anywhere, say, from Yorkshire towards East Anglia. Very gusty winds up to 50 miles an hour here as well. But out towards the west, I think the weather will